Greetings, my friends. It's good to be with you again and to share from the Word of God. I have a question as we get started. Uh, if I say the name Timothy Berners-Lee, Robert Kahn, or Sent Serf, do you know who I'm talking about? If I mention those three men, I, uh, I admit to you, I would not have a clue if someone asked me. But they, among others, are the concept designers for the World Wide Web. Sometimes uh, Robert Kahn is uh, referred to as the father of the web, but uh, uh, Timothy Berner Lee in England probably did uh, a lot of the preliminary work. Um, we rely on the World Wide Web quite a bit these days, don't we? Uh, to present things like this, to have Zoom Bible study on Tuesday night. We love that when we can see you and talk to you. Uh, our Friday night share in prayer. Uh, just It's just such a delight to be able to share through uh, means like this. And uh, so uh, this is pretty important. Uh, it's interesting to me to note that it was actually only made public, really public in 1989, only 31 years ago was the World Wide Web. It was originally designed to uh, help universities communicate with each other, scientists communicate with each other, governments to communicate. Uh, but today, everything, uh, it's, it's our hub of communication and, and we, uh, we hardly think we can live without it. But uh, uh, it all began uh, just 31 years ago as far as, as far as we're concerned. But, you know, thousands of years ago, in fact, maybe, maybe even more than that years ago, God established a web uh, that uh, reached out to us in salvation. It was uh, putting, he was putting together a web that leads to salvation. Uh, before the creation of the world, it was in his mind. He was thinking about you. Uh, Jesus came and, and uh, lived upon this earth to show us the love of God, and then he uh, died to show us the wealth of the grace of God and the mercy of God. He rose from the grave. We celebrated Easter just a couple Sundays ago. And today, the Holy Spirit uh, works in us, and with his power, we are spreading this web of uh, salvation across the earth. And so I, uh, I've titled the sermon today, the, the Web of the King. This is going to be the final one of this series about uh, the King is Coming. We've been looking at the book of Matthew and been looking at how uh, Jesus, our King, uh, all through these these times of uh, rejection, uh, of being uh, betrayed by those close to him, one one of the most uh, one of the disciples that was very close to him betrayed him, and uh, yet through all that time through this illegal trial, through them nailing him to the cross, through him being put into in, in, a tomb, he was still the king. And he arose to prove that he was the king. And uh, uh, then uh, he began to share for 40 days on the earth. He shared uh, about uh, what we should be doing. And that's what we want to look at today. The very last verses of the of the book of Matthew. I'm going to be reading them from the New Living Translation. And they they read like, uh, like this. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain uh, where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments that I have given to you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, 
even to the end of the age. Let me pray with us as we get started. Father, we are so thankful for this salvation that has been made available to us through Jesus Christ. And we want to take this, what we call the Great Commission, to heart so that we can be a part of the web of your love that is spread out across this world to all nations. And we are praying, Father, that you will guide us today and open our hearts to see the truths that you have for us in this passage, for we pray it in Christ's wonderful name. Amen. Well, let me give you a little bit the, the setting of the, of the passage. Uh, it was probably somewhere in the middle of the 40 days after Jesus resurrected from the grave. Uh, he was on the earth 40 days with his disciples. Uh, he met with them on that first Sunday night, first day of Easter. He met with them the very next Sunday uh, night again when Thomas was there. He met with the two on the road to Emmaus. He met with uh, Peter separately, with James separately. Uh, it says at one point he met with over 500 at one time. And many believe that this is that occasion. Uh, he told them to go to the mountain, a certain mountain in Galilee. And there uh, he would meet with them. And so he had announced this to them in Matthew 26, 32 at the, at, uh, the last supper that he had together with them. Uh, the angels told uh, the women, go and tell the disciples that he will uh, go before them to Galilee. And he told them to go to Galilee. And, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, uh, it says that at one point, uh, over 500 People saw him, to, uh, uh, and uh, this is that occasion, we believe. Uh, the mountain, we don't know exactly, but we know it was the mountain that he designated. So most likely, uh, it was uh, the Mount of, of uh, the Beatitudes, the Mount near the Sea of Galilee, that was known to them. We know that after that time, he came back to Jerusalem area because it was on the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem, that he ascended into heaven. So sometime in the middle of that 40 days, he is meeting here with them. And it says when they came, when he came, and they saw him, uh, that they worshipped him. Uh, this is the proper reaction to being in the presence of the king. They worshipped him. And this uh, word uh, is, is a word that we take the English word to prostrate, to fall prostrate before him. Uh, they worshipped him. Uh, in the book of Matthew that we've been looking at, uh, this word is used 12 times. In the other Gospels, not uh, nearly as many times. It starts at the very beginning. Uh, it says uh, the wise men that came at, after his birth, they worshipped him. Uh, the leader of the synagogue that was pleading for his for Jesus to heal his daughter. It says he fell before him and worshipped him. The disciples, after Jesus had walked on the water, uh, and, and then he had calmed the storm, it says they worshipped him. They worshipped him. The Galilea woman uh, uh, came and pleaded for her daughter, and Jesus said, uh, I've come to first to the Jews. And she said, well, even the dogs get the, the, the crumbs under the table. And he said, what great faith you have. And it says she worshiped him and her daughter was healed. The women who saw him right after the resurrection, uh, they worshiped him. And here now on the mount, it says when they saw him, they worshiped him. This would only be proper if Jesus was truly the Messiah, truly the King, and he truly was our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it also says some doubted, some doubted him. <laughs> now, this is not a rebellious disbelief. It's not them saying, I'm not going to believe it. I don't, I won't acknowledge him but a state of uncertainty and hesitation. In fact, this word is only used twice uh, in the book of Matthew. And the other time is when Peter was sinking down in the water 
And Jesus lifted him up and said, Peter, why did you doubt? Why was there that hesitation, that uncertainty that caused you to sink? Uh, it's pretty understandable that uh, of these 500, many had, had not seen him resurrected yet. And so they would, they would doubt. Uh, it also kind of proves the fact that this was not some kind of a hallucination or uh, some kind of a, of a trance that they were all in. It was, it was proof that they were human. And when they saw him and, and uh, uh, when we come to Christ, sometimes uh, we come and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Well, I want to look at this passage under three uh, topics. First, the, the king establishes his authority, his authority. He said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Um, Jesus always taught and worked and did miracles with authority. Uh, in uh, Matthew 7, 29, it says they were amazed because he taught with authority. Uh, in uh, 8, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, we see him healing with authority. Uh, in 9, 6, uh, he had the authority to forgive sin. People said only God can forgive sin. And, and he said, yes, uh, now that you, so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority. I say to this man, rise up and walk. In chapter 10, uh, verse 1, he delegated authority to cast out demons, even to his followers, and they went out uh, without authority. He says, I have authority over all the foes of heaven and all the foes on earth. In Ephesians 6, 12, we read that we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of unseen world, against mighty powers of this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. This, these principalities and powers seem to be ranking among the uh, demons. And Jesus said, I have power over all that. Power over the earth as well, which means I have, he had power over people, over passions, <laughs> over principles, over political movements of mankind, uh, also over the natural world. We see that in his time on the earth, that he could speak to the winds and they stop. He could uh, cause the waves and the storm to go away. He could uh, speak to diseases and to disasters. He had a power and authority over all of those. And when he rose from the dead, he showed that he had power over death as well. All authority is his. Secondly, we see that uh, the king commissions action. Because he has authority, he wants us, he wants you to take an action. And uh, I think sometimes when we see this, we think, well, yeah, but those were special people. Uh, if there were 500 there, there were a lot of ordinary people there. Uh, and uh, today, we're just ordinary people, aren't we? But God said, I have an action for you. In fact, when Jesus said to them to go and make disciples, uh, who was it? Who was that first band? Think for a minute about who it was. It was Peter who was the rash and the headstrong one. It was John, who sometimes uh, wishes to call fire down from heaven to destroy his enemies. It was Philip, uh, with whom the Savior had been so long, and yet he did not know him. He said, you show us the Father. And he said, Philip, Philip, I've been with you all this time. I, You see me, you see the Father. It was Thomas who who said, I, I can't believe until I put my, my fingers in his hands, until I uh, see him personally. Uh, most of them were fishermen, uh, ordinary guys, ordinary people. Uh, and he said, go, all power is given to me and make disciples everywhere. Uh, you are 
created for his purpose. And he wants to use you to reach out. There is no power in you, but all power is in him. And therefore, you uh, can go. You can go. Well, uh, what did he ask us to do? What is the real task that he gave uh, to us? Uh, and when we look at this passage, we often uh, look at and see that there are uh, not just one or two, but there are four verbs here. But in reality, there's only one major uh, verb. Uh, he said, go, but he, he really said that's a, a passive aorist participle. In other words, he said, having gone, as you have gone, do this. He said, baptize them. But he said, it's the present participle. Keep on baptizing them. Uh, he said, teaching them, uh, teaching them to observe. Again, active present participle, keep on teaching. But the main verb, the only main verb here is make disciples. Make people into learners, into followers of me. Having uh, gone into all nations, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Well, how, how do we make disciples? I think the, the other three verbs give us the, the clue to how do we make disciples of Jesus Christ. First, he said, uh, having gone or going, it takes contact uh, with people to Spread the, spread the gospel. Right now, we're in this time where uh, we're afraid to have contact with people because it spreads viruses, and we're staying back from people and not touching uh, people. But if you want uh, to spread the gospel, we have to be out there with the people. Uh, we have to make contact with our neighbors, with the people that we work with, with our relatives, with our friends. Uh, we, uh, someone has said that Christianity is a lot like a cold. Uh, you, the catching it is more likely the longer you're with someone who is infected and the closer you are to them. And so if you want to reach out and touch other people, uh, you're going to have to make contact with them. And I, and I know we're not talking physical contact here, but we're talking uh, personal uh, contact Baptizing them uh, is, is, in the Old Testament, those who were identified as followers of God were circumcised, the men were. Uh, but in the New Testament, we don't call upon people to be circumcised, but to be baptized. It's an outward de uh, declaration of an inward transformation. It literally means to immerse them. And notice how we are to baptize. We are to baptize in the name, singular, because there's only one God, not three gods, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the time when people are incorporated uh, into the family of God, into the salvation of God. In biblical times, it was done immediately after people confess their belief in Jesus Christ. Sometimes the church has, has separated it from that, but I think correctly, biblically, when a person makes a profession of faith, and I, I know during this time, some of them are making professions of faith, and I expect that once we're able to get together, uh, we're planning to have a baptism service. And if you have, are a believer in Jesus Christ and have not been baptized, we invite you, we're going to be inviting you to be a part of that baptism uh, as you proclaim uh, the, the, to the, all the world that you belong to him. You died with him and rose again with him. And then he said teaching, but not teaching just for knowledge. Uh, he, it, he, he was teaching them to observe or to obey all that Christ taught. Uh, we are to teach like Jesus taught, uh, not in a classroom necessarily. We can start there, uh, but it's kind of like uh, teaching someone to ride a bicycle or drive a car. Uh, you can't just do it in a classroom. You got to get out there, get on the bicycle. Uh, uh, most of us who are fathers remember running along, holding the back of the bike and, uh, until the child felt confident enough and we could let go 
and they could ride. But we, we had to train them how to do it, how to get their balance, how to get going. And uh, when we are teaching uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to do the same thing. We have to hold on, be, stay close with them, correct their mistakes at the beginning, and then let them go. Because the goal of a disciple is uh, to make more disciples and to reach out to more. So we are training them, particularly using the Word of God. And in, in fact, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it, it says this, All Scripture is inspired by God, and is useful to teach what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives, to correct us when we are wrong, and to teach us what to do, what is right. Um, and so in the Word of God, we have all that we need uh, to move people forward in following Jesus Christ. Uh, the scope of our commission is is wonderful because it's to all nations and uh, it's not uh, could be better translated maybe to all peoples because uh, it's not talking about political nations it's talking about all the people of the earth so the action uh, is to go and make disciples and finally uh, the king promises the ability uh, he said i am with you uh, always to the end of the age. And it's and so it's based upon his person, I am. In fact, this was the name that God used for himself in the Old Testament to identify himself. I am the ever-present one from the beginning of time until the end of time. Um, his presence means a lot. <laughs> when God is with us, we have uh, his uh, protection. We have his power. We have his peace. Jesus uh, said when he was getting ready to leave, my peace I give to you. Not so as the world gives, but uh, I'm giving you peace. Even in the time like we're living in today, when there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future is going to be, we can have peace because we have Christ's peace in us. Uh, his presence means privilege, the privilege of being children of the king. We don't have to make an appointment. Uh, we don't have to go through some secretary or through uh, some office to get together with our father. He's our father. We uh, have the privilege of calling him Abba, father, uh, daddy, if you will, or papa, whatever that personal term is in your language. Um, he said uh, that I am going to be with you, with you. It is, it is powered by his presence, by his presence. Actually, this was God's plan from the very beginning. Remember one of the names of Jesus. One of the names they called him was Emmanuel, which means God with us. Um, we have that privilege of being with him all the time. And then it's, 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 it's designated for you personally. I know the you, if you look it up here, is, is a, a plural you, but it's also the singular. God created you with the talents and the strengths and the weaknesses that you have. Some of those help us to rely on other people. We need each other to accomplish what God wants. Um, he, he created you to be a disciple, which means you're always going to be developing, always be learning. You're not going to be a master or an expert. We're not to go out and make masters. We're to go out and make disciples. Paul, the great apostle Paul, toward the end of his life, said it, explained it like this in uh, Philippians 3.12. I do not mean that I'm already as God wants me to be. I'm, I'm not already perfect, he said. I have not yet reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it and make it mine. And here's the goal that he said, Christ wants me to do that, which is the reason he made me. Uh, Paul said, I want to be what God called me 
to be. We don't need to look at other people and say, oh, I want to be like him, or I want to uh, sing like she does, or I want to uh, play the piano uh, like they do. Um, you begin to compare yourself, and you, you always find someone that's much better uh, at it. God doesn't want you to be like them. He wants you to be like you. He wants you to be the disciple that he called you to be. He loves you. He designed you to be this disciple. And it's it's lasting in perpetuity. Yeah. <laughs> Forever. Yeah, there's a word there, and I wrote it down, and you can read it on your outline. Right now, I can't get my mind to say it. I'm not going to try anymore. Uh, always, even into the end of the age. Always. Always, this word means the whole day, every day. The whole day, every day. Not always on Sunday uh, when you're gathered in church or always when you're just when you're reading your Bible or always just when you're in prayer, but always all day, every day. Until the end of the age or the end of time. He already said, go to all nations. So he didn't have to say all of the world again. It's all the ages, all the time. In fact, all is all through this, isn't it? All authority is given to him so that we can go to all nations and make disciples that learn to observe all that he has taught. Uh, and he is with us always, even to the end of all time. Well, what conclusions can we draw from this? I just want to draw uh, three, okay? One is that the king launched this web of authority, action, and ability thousands of years ago with you in mind, with me in mind, and with you in mind, okay? Uh, it is a personal web of love and power that God wants to make a difference in your life. Um, he sent out disciples to make disciples, who would make disciples. In fact, Paul understood this concept and he said to his disciple, Timothy, you have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. So he had someone was witnessing to him. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So what I have learned from others, I am to teach you so that you can teach reliable people so that they can teach others. And the, and the word and the gospel, the web of the gospel goes on and on and on. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we can draw from this passage, and we need to draw from this passage, that the king expects every disciple to carry on the Great Commission. You. You say, well, I, I'm not very good at this, or I'm not good at that, or you don't know who I am. Uh, no, I, I don't know all the things about you, but God knows everything about you. And he designed you to be his disciple, but also he designed you to make disciples. That means we can't have any excuses. You know, well, you know, I have this problem, or I have this fault, uh, because he molded you and continues molding you to be useful for him, just like you, just as you are. You can't say, well, yeah, but I, I was born with this problem. Some of you know uh, the testimony of, of Nick uh, Juikik. It's kind of an interesting name. Uh, he was born with no arms and no legs. And yet... He has had a tremendous ministry of touching people uh, who have handicaps and say, well, I can't do anything for God. Here's a man with no arms, no legs, but he's ministered to thousands, probably millions of people saying, look, God can touch you just like he touched me. And you don't have to have all the 
other other things. Uh, some some of you say, yeah, but something happened in my life, and so God, God can't use me. No excuses, because there's Johnny, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Uh, when she was almost eighteen, she was seventeen years old. She dove into some shallow water, and she broke her neck, and. Ever since that time, uh, she's been a quadriplegic. She's still alive today, which is a miracle in itself. And she went through all the, the grieving times and all the hard times at first. Uh, so did Nick. He said at, at one time in his life, he tried to kill himself because he thought he was worthless. And, and jo Johnny went through those times where she tried this and tried that. She wanted to be healed or she wanted to even considered suicide. But then when she saw how much God loved her and when he saw how much God loved him, they wanted to share that uh, with without having use of her body. She has written 48 books. She leads a major ministry that ministers to handicapped people all around the world. She gives her testimony openly and often to people around the world. If if those two can do it, if, if you say, well, but I was born this way, you have arms and legs, then you can certainly give testimony for Christ. Uh, or you say, something happened in my life. You don't know my past. Well, I don't know any, very many of us who uh, at the height of, of, of of life, 17 year olds, that, that, that's kind of the jumping off place. And, and, and in her life, it was the ending of her physical uh, abilities. But uh, God can use those two. He can use you. He can use me. No substitutes. Uh, I, I think too often today we say, well, we hire a preacher. He does this. We hire missionaries. We have, we have Bible scholars there to do this. But God wants you to make disciples. And he has the authority for you to do it. One final uh, conclusion. And then thinking of this web idea, uh, the king has woven a web of cloth uh, to go around you. It says in the Bible that we're to put on Christ. We're to wear him. Uh, some of you are from parts of the world where there's a, a tartan, a certain weave. In fact, I looked up to see what the Blake tartan uh, looks like, a beautiful weave that uh, could identify me as, as a part of that, uh, that clan. Uh, here in Bavaria, uh, each village has, a, uh, has the truck and their, their special traditional dress that identifies them. I believe that God wants us to be identified and the identity is that of Christ. When people look at us, they should see the love of Christ. They should see the care of Christ for us. That's the web that he wants to, to mark you with. Uh, and the question is, is this, are you continuing to learn? Are you a disciple, a real disciple? Or, or do you want to just uh, audit the class? Uh, uh, Tony Evans uses this illustration, and he said that sometimes people just want to audit the Christian life. If you're in a in a, a university setting, uh, some of them allow you to audit classes, so you can listen to the lectures, uh, and you can go to class when you want to. You don't. There's no attendance regulation. You don't have to take any test. Uh, you don't have to do the papers. You just kind of listen in. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes Christians thinks, think they can audit Christianity. I'll just audit. I just, I'll just listen. I don't want to get really involved. But this is not an audit class. Uh, God wants you to be actively involved. And so the first question is, are you really learning what it means to follow Christ? Is God, are you allowing God to work on areas of your life that need improvement or need to be changed or need to be eliminated? And secondly, is are you active in 
reaching out to someone else. I believe every Christian ought to have uh, people above them uh, that they are learning from, that are, there are their mentors. Sometimes it's persons, sometimes it's books. There are certain books that we can learn from. We have written uh, mentors as well as living mentors. But we also need to have students, disciples, if you will. Uh, for you as the, who are parents, uh, your most important disciples are your children. The things that they will learn, they will not learn because you tell them, but because you show them. The most important way for them to know about God is to see how you relate to God. Be sure that you are showing them the right way by following in the right way yourself. But I believe there should be others. There may be someone at work that is watching you and you are beginning to tell them about Christ. Uh, I believe that we should always be looking for those. Uh, we are to go into all the world. We're out there. We're among them. And we should bring them into that relationship with Jesus Christ. Can I uh, pray with us right now uh, about the, the role that God has given us, the, the action that he desires from us? Uh, he has the authority and he gives us the ability, but we have to take the action in the middle. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ, all the authority, all the power is available. We thank you that he didn't leave us to do this alone. He said, I am with you always. What an amazing God you are, that you would be there to give us the very words to speak, the very actions to take. And yet, Lord, you are calling upon us to make disciples, to go out there, be among them, to immerse them into the teaching and, and the way of God, and to teach them to observe the things that you have commanded. Oh, Father, I pray that you will help us each one to fulfill the role that you have given us to do, to reach this world for Jesus Christ, particularly at this time, when because of the virus, uh, people are asking questions, people are looking for answers. Lord, help us to be alert to your Holy Spirit so that we can be there when others ask, that you would help us to, as it, as it is said uh, in Peter, to be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in us to all that ask. Father, we pray these things in the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining uh, today. And uh, uh, thank you for being a part of things. Watch. If you want to be a part of our Tuesday night Bible study, send me your email and I'll, I'll uh, get you on. We, it's kind of fun. We're having, uh, there's a uh, people from Canada, a young man from Canada that joins with us, a couple from up in Berlin that are there with us sometimes. And uh, so wherever you are, if you want to join on Tuesday night, send me your email and I'll send you a Zoom link and, and we'll be able to see each other. On Friday night, uh, I send out a link uh, openly uh, that uh, you can join us for uh, share in prayer. Time's not very long. We just kind of uh, see how each other's doing, what's going on in our lives, ask for prayer requests, and we pray together. If you have specific prayer requests that you would like to get out to our church family, send those to uh, Mary Clellan. It's just mary at uh, clellan.net. Pretty easy. Uh, but if uh, watch on the page, the invitation to this uh, video, there'll be that. Marilyn's making another program for the kids. And so uh, be sure to watch that with your kids uh, because you'll want to know what they hear. Besides, you'll enjoy it. Uh, and uh, we're still looking for opportunities to, to uh, encourage and bless each other. Keep calling each other. Keep greeting each other. Uh, if you see on our uh, uh, church uh, Facebook page, there's a flower contest going on. We have big, huge prizes, but it's kind of fun seeing the, the picture. So go out and take a picture of a flower. Go to uh, Munich Christian Fellowship Facebook page. 
find the uh, article that says uh, the flower show is open, officially open, and then click on comment and upload your picture. And then after May 5, we're going to have uh, a voting of, and see which, which is the favorite uh, picture on there. Just, just something to do. We want to get you out of your uh, homes a little bit and maybe out find a, a flower. If it's one you've grown, great. If it's not, it's just as good. Just go and take a picture of a beautiful flower out there and put it on. And uh, be sure to uh, keep contact uh, with each other. It is so delightful to be with you. Uh, I pray God's blessing upon you. Let me uh, give you a word of benediction. I pray that uh, the power, the authority of Christ, and the presence of Jesus Christ in your life will allow you to uh, open your eyes and see the need of others around you, and that you will be used as a light in this world. I pray it in Jesus' name. God's blessing upon you. Amen. Thank you.